Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I am Pradeep here, surgical oncologist and your surgery faculty from Media Plexus. So today we are going to have a quick rapid revision of the initial surgery previous year questions. Right? So the commonly repeated high yield topics asked in initial surgery are from the following sections. From general surgery, the most of the questions are from tubes, drains, needles, as well as sutures, vent flaunts, vascular access, ulcers, wound infection, and surgical position. And from trauma, mostly from primary survey of the ATLS system and head injury related questions with abdominal as well as urological trauma. Coming to the GIT, majority of the questions are from the X-ray based ML surgical emergencies or image based questions and also majority from the gallbladder, be it a malignancy or a gallstone or a bile duct injury related issues and from syndromic colorectal conditions as well as from esophagus with the barium swallow as well as the GERD disease and the esophageal motility disorders commonly being the cliche card. And from the breast and endocrine, in the current, in the recent past, the breast and endocrine questions have come a bit down and mostly related to the breast evaluation as well as the thyroid evaluation and the management of the early breast cancer as well as the DCAS. Coming to the urology, majority are from the congenital anomalies and vascular surgery, only few questions and image-based questions are related to the varicose veins or the venous ulcers and rest are uh, some one or two questions from the past three year initial questions. So in this session, we will cover the general surgery and the trauma and the remaining session, uh, remaining things in the next session. Moving on to the first question, a patient received in the emergency room following history of road traffic accident. His pulse rate is uh, 134 per minute. Blood pressure was 90 by 60. The ER physician asked you to start an IV cannula for the resuscitation. What is the maximum flow rate of the fluid with this IV cannula in the image as shown? So in the image shown, you know that this is a, sorry, this is a green wind flown, right? So the green wind flown belongs to which gauge? So when it comes to the, sorry. When it comes to the gauging uh, measurements, the 18 gauge belongs to the green. So you remember as 18, 18 is the green signal for all the things in India, like for voting or as well as for marriage or for driving lessons. So for an 18 gauge cannula, what is the maximum flow rate? For an 18 gauge cannula, the maximum flow rate is 90 ml per minute. Let's move on to the, let's quickly revise the rapid color codes. So the color code starts from 14, 14 is for orange and 16 is for gray. The 16, 18, 20, 22 are the commonly used uh, color codes that are used in our routine day-to-day -day practice. 16 is for gray and flawed. 18, as I mentioned, 18 is the green signal for everything. So it, you, can, you can remember it as 18 as green. And 20 is for pink, commonly used for fluid transfusion. And 22 is for blue, commonly used for adolescents. And 24 that you must have seen in the pediatric wards. Moving on to the flow rate. Gray, 180 ml, divided by 2. Green, that is 90 ml. Then 60 for pink and flawed. And 36 for blue and flawed. These are the four things you just have to keep memorizing. Right? So what is this IV cannula gauge? This gauge is nothing but if it, if it is a 20 gauge, that is 1 20th of an inch in millimeter. So the gauge represents the outer diameter of the IV cannula. The gauge represents the outer diameter of the IV cannula. Similarly, there is another thing that is a French. French, it represents the outer circumference of the catheter. So the gauge is used in needles as well as cannulas. 
the french is used in catheters and tubes so gauge meaning outer diameter french meaning outer circumference so what do you mean by french french is equal to the diameter in millimeter into 3 3 times the diameter in millimeter is french okay so what are the commonly known french codes you know so you know uh, 12 french 14 french 16 french and 18 french these are the commonly used frenches with regard to catheters or rail tube catheters or rail tube the 12 french is white in color 14 french is green in color 16 french is orange in color and 18 french is red in color right now moving on to the next question sutures versus surgical use you have to make the correct match so on the left hand side we have the sutures on the right hand side that appropriate surgical use so reading it out polypropylene polypropylene is called proline right so polypropylene is a proline suture polyamide is a nylon suture or a ethylon suture polyglactin is nothing but a vicryl suture and polydioxinone is a pds suture moving on to the surgical use for tendon repair we can either use a nylon as well as a proline because the tendon repair require maximum amount of tensile strength retains only non absorbable sutures like ethylon and proline will retain the tensile strength for a longer period moving on to the bowel anastomosis bowel anastomosis we routinely use absorbable sutures commonly is the vicryl for abdominal closure the guideline recommends pds suture is the suture material of choice for all abdominal closures so in hernia repair we routinely use proline sutures either for donning or for mesh fixation so you can appropriately choose proline for hernia repair that leaves away ethylon for tendon repair let's have a quick revision of suture materials the suture materials are broadly classified into natural as well as synthetic so the natural suture materials are basically made of proteins so they require proteolytic degradation in our body tissue so the degradation is usually not predictable so they can stand in a long time for in a, in certain people whereas they can be lost in certain individuals in a very short period moving on to the synthetic synthetic are nothing but they are made made up of polymers of glucose polymers of carbohydrates so they require hydrolytic degradation or a hydrolysis they are predictable so the common examples for a natural suture materials are number 1 is a silk and catgut the common examples for synthetic suture materials are you name it vicryl or proline okay then moving on to the monofilament versus multifilament monofilament means they have only a single filament of a suture material whereas multifilament is multiple suture materials that have been braided just like the hair of a female the monofilament since it is a monofilament it is easy to slide through tissues since it is easy to slide through it has a poor knot holding capacity
excuse me whereas the multi filament has a very good knot holding capacity <coughs> but the only drawback is it is associated with infection infections are more common in the multi filament because of the bacteria that can <coughs> grow in the crevices of the suture material kindly excuse me Now moving on to next classification that is absorbable versus non-absorbable suture material. When it comes to absorbable, they are made up of usually either synthetic or natural and they undergo degradation in our body. They undergo degradation in our body. They do not undergo degradation. Hence, they retain tensile strength for a longer period. So, tensile strength is nothing but the ability or the force that is required to break the sutures. Okay. When the tensile strength is more, the sutures can be relied upon for many years. For tendon repair, the force required to break the suture should be very high. Only then the, the suture will hold the tissues together till the tendon heals. If you use an absorbable suture for a tendon repair, it is very likely that the tendon repair will fail because of the force exerted between the tendon ends. The common examples of absorbable sutures are Vicryl, Monocryl and Cantip. The common examples of non-absorbable sutures are nylon, proline. Then moving on to the suture sizes. The commonly used suture size guide was zeros. If it is a one zero <coughs> and it becomes two zero or three zero. One zero, two zero, three zero. When the number of zeros increase, the size, the diameter of the suture decreases. When the number of zeros increase, the diameter of the suture decreases. Recently, this zeros has been replaced by metric size. Metric size. So 3.5 metric is a one zero or a zero suture. Three metric is a two zero suture. 2.5 metric is a three zero suture right it is given by metric size suppose if they ask suture sizes in metric you just use 3.5 as a guide for a 10 suture so that you can easily solve the question so the commonly used suture materials and the surgical use we will we will see now cat gut nowadays it is not at all used previously it was used in uh, Conditions where you want to close the subcutaneous wounds. Okay. Nowadays, no use nowadays. Even in India, we don't use. Surgical steel is common. It's nothing but a stainless steel wire that is commonly used to hold the sternotomy wounds. Closure of sternotomy wounds. Polyester or ethibon. So these three are non absorbable up to nylon. Polyester or ethibon is used to close the thoracotomy wounds. Polyester 
proline is commonly used <coughs> for hernia repairs skin closure vascular anastomosis like you use 4050 proline right nylon or ethylon commonly used in skin closure and tendon repairs monocryl or polycryl capron vicryl and pds these three are absorbable sutures monocryl is commonly used in subcuticular closure or in facial suturing where the sutures can be removed in 5 days vicryl is commonly used in subcutaneous closures and most importantly bowel anastomosis pds has now replaced vicryl in many areas particularly bowel bile duct as well as urethral anastomosis because pds is a monofilament suture whereas vicryl is a multifilament suture the multifilament suture acts as a needles for infection also the cause for stone formation in biliary tract as well as the urinary tract that's why pds has replaced vicryl in biliary as well as urinary system anastomosis biliary pancreatic duct anastomosis urethral anastomosis and most importantly abdominal closure this is where the pds has been used nowadays next moving on to the next question a patient underwent total mastectomy in axillary direction and the surgical drain was placed beneath the flap and axilla as shown in the image below what type of drain is it this is the drain box okay this is the drain box you could visualize there are multiple layers which can be for by which you can apply suction by compressing it and connecting it to the tubings this is the drain box that is this is the tubing so it is a example that you cannot find any gap or any communication with the exterior so it is a type of a closed drain so what are drains drains are nothing but these are hollow tubes that drain the collection to the surface what are the common collections you encounter during drain it can be either a blood or a serum or a lymph in a patient who had undergone a nodal dissection or any major surgeries or it can be used to drain the pus or urine or any intestinal leak or any bile these are the common drain effluents we routinely see in our day to day practice moving on to the classification of drains the drains are broadly classified into two types number 1 it is open number 2 it is closed open drains are nothing but they have direct communication to the skin so they drain through gravity so that means gravity aids their drainage so they require frequent change of dressings for example you use a corrugated drain tube corrugated rubber tube 
or a penrose drain suppose you do a incision and drainage for an abscess but you suspect there will be future collection of collection owing to the cavity so you can very well place a corrugated drain tube so that it will drain daily so that you have to change the dressings and you have to inspect the wound daily daily so the only indication for open drains are in infected wounds particularly an abscess then moving on to the closed drains you have a suction drain as well as a non suction drain the suction drain is the example that has been shown in the image before that means the drain aided by suction here the drainage is aided by capillary action capillary action and gravity so the suction drain the example is a romovac drain that is shown before romovac or a minivac drain if it is in a smaller component it is called a minivac drain the non suction drains are nothing but tube drains so commonly you use a icd drain or a abdominal drain adk drain they are available in various sizes what are the pros and cons of drains so the pros are first the it can drain the contents that we expected not to be collected in our body number 2 it can signal any bleed why are we keeping the drain to prevent collection of fluid in the cavity that has been left behind after any surgical resection or to prevent the collection of blood or to prevent the or to identify whether there are any leak after surgery it can signal any bleed or any leak from the surgery these are the pros of a drain and if at all if there is any leak you can keep the drain for a prolonged drainage to have it as a controlled fistula convert into a controlled fistula the cons are number 1 when you keep the drain there is increased chance for infection the patient will be associated with severe pain and because of the drain placement the patient have to stay in the hospital for a longer period and the first important thing all these things the pros can be ameliorated by a block in the drain what if the drain gets blocked and you you gets fooled that there is no any bleed or any anastomotic leak these are the cons of a drain why i am discussing it in 20th edition the drains have been discussed extensively okay these are the future areas for questions in the forth forthcoming examinations in non gi surgeries avoid routine drain in as per the bailey i am teaching so avoid routine drain in in non gi surgeries they mention thyroidectomy breast lumpectomy and inguinal hernia repair consider routine drain in all nodal dissections be it a groin node dissection or axillary lymph node dissection mastectomies parotidectomies or in obese patients undergoing ventral hernia repair in gi surgeries you can very well avoid routine drain in hepatectomies because we don't expect any leak in hepatectomies <coughs> as well as in small bowel surgeries because this anastomosis is very less likely to leak and in colon surgeries 
particularly right colon as well as in cholecystectomies. Consider routine drain in most important thing is esophageal surgery because esophageal surgery is a highly morbid surgery where there is increased risk of salivary leak as well as the intestinal leak and major pancreatic surgeries like Whipple's and gastrectomies and in rectal surgeries like LAR that is low anterior resection or a abdominoperineal resection where there is a high chance of collection of blood in the pelvis as well as there is a chance of leak in coloanal anastomosis, particularly in patients undergoing low anterior resections. Then these are the common areas that has been asked in your previous unit. So the following picture shows, what is this picture? It's nothing but a rail shoe. <clears throat> In one of the examination, how do you measure the rail shoe? What are the color codes? Color codes we already discussed. 16 French is orange. 12 is white. 14 is green. 16 is orange. And 18 is red. The same holds good for police catheter also. So what is the length of the rail shoe? The length of the rail tube is 105 centimeters. How do you measure the rail tube? How much amount of rail tube should be inserted into the patient's body? That is given by the measurement next in adults. That is tip of the nose, not the nose bridge. Tip of the nose, ear lobe, and as well as the zippy sternum. You start measuring from the tip of the nose to the ear lobe, nose to the ear lobe to the zippy sternum. That gives the length to be inserted into the through the patient nostril. In child, it is given by Nemu. Tip of the nose to the ear lobe to the midpoint of umbilicus, midpoint between the umbilicus and the zippy sternum. That is Nemu. This is how the rail shoe. What are the indications for rail shoe? Number one, gastric decompression in patients who are undergoing surgery or in patients in obstruction, post op patients. Another thing is, is for feeding in patients having neck cancers, oral cancer, oropharyngeal cancers in patients who are unable to swallow their food, rail shoe feeding is given. Particularly in patients who are having any head trauma or spinal trauma, these patients will not be conscious enough to have a nutrition. In bedborne patients, rail shoe feeding is an important form of providing nutrition to the patients. Similarly, Apart from tubes, bags are also being asked in your examinations. So these are the drain bags. So what is this drain bag? This is from one of my patients who underwent a esophagectomy. So this is a ICD bag. This is a ICD bag. The peculiarity of ICD bag is an underwater sealed drain. How to differentiate an ICD from a Euro bag? Number one, there is a tube that is present and there is a marking for the water level. And this tube will be below the level of water level. Since pleural cavity is a negative pressure area, which each inspiration, the negative pleural pressure increases, thereby it sucks the further air from the atmospheric, from the atmosphere. If the end of the tube is not below the level of water, that's why for ICDs, we always use an underwater seal drain to prevent the atmospheric air from being sucked into the pleural cavity. If the water level is not filled, 
or when the tube is not below the level of water atmosphere air will get sucked into the pleural cavity thereby it causes tension pneumothorax and the patient will succumb immediately so it acts as a one way drainage alone whatever that is present inside the pleural cavity be it a air or a blood that will be drained into the bag but either air or water will not be sucked into the pleural cavity so if you look at if, if it is a video you could notice a oscillatory motion of the fluid column which each inspiration and expiration this fluid column will move this way and this way this is called the oscillatory pattern of which each inspiration and expiration that is what seen in the icd bag right this is the example of a euro bag this is a commonly used euro bag see there is no tube there is no tube inside the bag this is used to measure whatever the these lines are used to measure whatever how much amount of fluid is being collected there is an a slightly advanced model of a euro bag that is called a euro flow meter bag so initially the urine gets collected in this plastic box with a measuring if you want to calculate the hourly urine output particularly in icu patients urine that is collected for the shower that is if it comes under 75 ml if they lift the plastic bottle there is a opening here that can drain here so every hourly they can measure it without disconnecting the bag from the foley if you have to use this bag hourly monitoring is very difficult so if you have to use this bag hourly monitoring is very easy right let's move on to the next question identify the surgical position shown in the image so this is a head up position that means it is a pure inclination so ideally this is a neutral position this is the supine position so this is a head up position this is a head down position so the head up position is a trendlenberg position or a, i mean sorry it is a reverse trendlenberg position head down position is a trendlenberg position okay let's discuss about the other positions and their common use in use in surgeries the reverse trendlenberg position is commonly used in head and neck surgeries right the reverse trendlenberg position is commonly used in head and neck surgeries so day in and day out we operate on all head and neck cases as well as the oral cavity cancers wherein we have to do a neck dissection the patient will be placed in a reverse trendlenberg position with the neck extended and turned to the contralateral side that neck extension is called rose position then moving on to the trendlenberg position trendlenberg position is a head down position it is commonly used in pelvic and gynec surgeries so particularly hysterectomies laparoscopic hysterectomies laparoscopic rectal surgeries we use a trendlenberg position so uh, while placing the patient in a reverse trendlenberg and a trendlenberg position patient has to be given adequate supports to prevent the patient from sliding upwards or downwards depending on the position the important uh, pitfall associated with the trendlenberg position is since the patient is in a head down the abdominal contents will have a compression effect on the diaphragm so it will have a severely increased respiratory pressure okay the anesthetist will be having trouble in maintaining the proper ventilation when the patient is kept in a steep trendlenberg position but that is required for a very short period during laparoscopic rectal surgeries right 
This is the common supine position, commonly used in laparotomies, midline laparotomies, etc., as well as breast surgeries. Breast surgeries, I usually tend to abduct the uh, ipsilateral upper limb and place the patient in a reverse front and back position so that the breast usually falls downwards with the gravity. Prone position is commonly used in spine surgeries or in patients who are undergoing VATS esophageal, esophageal surgeries, that is thoracoscopic esophageal surgeries. Thoracoscopic esophageal surgeries for esophageal mobilization, we put the patient in prone position. And also, extra elevator APR surgeries, wherein you have to remove full of the levator anine muscle along with the rectum. And lateral position commonly is used for kidney surgeries. That means removal of the kidney. And also in cases with pylonidal sinus or any swellings in the back. Right? This is the famous lithotomy position. In lithotomy position commonly used for cervical examination or a gynecological examination and biopsies. Gynecological, that means endometrial biopsy, cervix biopsy. Or you do bottom cases, bottom surgeries like fissure in nano. Fisher, hemorrhoids, all these surgeries require lithotomy position. <clears throat> and this position is called Lloyd Davis position, which is a slight modification of the lithotomy position. In lithotomy position, if you note, the hip is flexed almost 90 degree. But in Lloyd Davis position, the hip is flexed only 15 degree. 15 degree flexion at hip with Trenlenburg position is called Lloyd Davis position. This position is commonly required for laparoscopic rectal surgeries because you need to operate both anteriorly, that means both through the abdomen as well as through the perineum. Laparoscopic rectal surgeries and laparoscopic hysterectomies because you need to deliver the specimen through vagina and not through the abdomen. In open hysterectomies, you make an incision and then you deliver the specimen through the abdomen. Whereas in laparoscopic hysterectomy, you have to deliver the specimen through the vagina. So it will be very easy for you to operate when you place the patient in a Lloyd Davis position. Right? Right. Moving on to the next part. Which of the following statement is true regarding the venous axis? Venous axis. We have a central venous as well as a peripheral venous axis. Number one statement. Isotonic saline and heparin is flushed to maintain patency. That is a true statement. Phlebitis is the most common complication in peripheral venous axis. That is also true statements because we must have seen in our routine day-to-day -day wards most of the patient complaining of thrombophlebitis and severe pain in the site of the cannula. If an AV fistula is present in a limb, avoid peripheral venous axis in the same limb. That is also a true statement. Vasopressin, it is the most potent vasopressor. Okay. It is usually given in septic shock. And they are routinely given through central lines to avoid limb ischemia. Because if you give a vasopressor in a peripheral line, it can extravasate and it can cause a limb ischemia. Okay. So this is also a true statement. I have a cl clinical scenario related to this limb ischemia with the use of vasopressors. During my MS post graduation in 2000, way back in 2013, I was called for an MICU follower where a 95 male had a upper limb ischemia. He was in septic shock 
and he was treated with inotropes as well as vasopressors which are given through the peripheral line through the peripheral line vasopressors were given that's why he has developed a limb ischemia and that could not be salvaged for which we have ended up with doing a amputation so you remember the clinical scenario that vasopressors should always be given through the central venous lines so the answer will be all or two <coughs> let's discuss about the venous excess epidural so we routinely know the venous excess or peripheral peripheral is commonly used iv cannulas so then generally the maximum recommended use is up to 72 hours the most common complication is going to be phlebitis and pain and extravasation and infection is the other complication but it is not a most common complication and infection is the most important complication why because whenever the a uh, line gets infected it becomes systemic the blood culture will be positive the patient will rapidly go into sepsis right moving on to the central venous excess central venous excess we have three number one is peripherally inserted central catheters they are called pick lines and number two central venous catheters and number three are implantable port otherwise called as porta cath or chemoport peripherally inserted central catheters we insert the vascular catheter through a peripheral vein the most commonly preferred peripheral vein is the basilic vein the venous catheter is inserted through the basilic vein and the tip of the catheter is placed in the central vein basilic vein is the site of insertion and the tip of the catheter at the KO atrial junction that means superior vena cava right atrial junction the pick lines are used when you have to use for approximately 1 month central venous catheters central venous catheters are the catheters that are commonly used in patients who require blood transfusion total parenteral nutritions and who require hemodynamic monitoring during resuscitation or any major surgeries it can be either tunnel or non tunnel tunneled catheters are called hickman catheters so that generally the tunnel catheters will have a very less chance of infection because they are protected under the skin non tunnel catheters are used only for short term they can be used for less than 2 weeks and tunnel catheters can be used for 1 month implantable port or porta cath catheters they can be used for long term so these are nothing but there will be a chamber the chamber is having a venous catheter and it will be placed inside the vessel channel every time you can transfuse fluid through the chamber with the help of a needle that is called a huber's needle so this is the chest x ray that shows the central venous catheter that has been placed way below it is placed in the ivc this is the wrong position so every time you place the central venous catheter you have to always check the position either intraoperatively during the uh, surgery itself with the help of a c arm or immediate post operatively with a chest x ray it should be placed at the ko atrial junction how can we how can you be so sure about the ko atrial junction in a chest x ray that means at the level of the carina so this is the trachea this is the right bronchus this is the left bronchus so the tip should have, should have been placed at this 
that indicates the KO atrial junction. If it is far, uh, if it is placed well beyond into the right atrium, it can cause arrhythmias. It can cause ventricular premature ecto ectopics, VPCs, or it can cause heart chamber rupture. So that's why the position of the tip is very important. So what are the complications? Complications can be infection and arterial puncture is another complication while trying to enter into the vein. The commonly used uh, central venous, central veins are IJV as well as subclavian. IJV is usually the most preferred one because it has it is the vein that is associated with less no, less complications. Whereas subclavian vein is usually placed beneath the bones. It is very difficult to access as well as uh, it cannot be accessed with the ultrasound guidance because of the bones. And it has an additional complication of pneumothorax if we inadvertently injure the pleural cavity. Pneumothorax, particularly in subclavian veins. Not in IJV. This is the CM picture showing the placement of a chemoport in one of my patients. So look, this is the chemoport chamber. This is the venous catheter that has been placed in the 